out of all the sections in this little sermon that we've been going through, this Sermon on the Mount, out of all the lessons or the many lessons that we've been able to pull out from the larger lesson, this Sermon on the Mount, out of all the many sermons within the larger sermon, this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, this section here this morning would seem to be the least significant, especially if you take into account, especially in comparison to some of the themes we've already discussed and the themes that are still ahead. Just for a moment, I think it's a good time to stop for a second and to give sort of a recap of what we've talked about and what's to come. So far, if you've been with us, we've began Matthew chapter 5 and this sermon that Jesus was teaching And we spent the first few weeks together in this section, in this sermon, by taking a look at, in verses 1 through 12, that section known as the Beatitudes. Or in other words, this is what your attitude should be like if you are in relationship, if you are following after Jesus. And so we spent some time talking about that, and then we transitioned to another section. You guys remember we talked about being salt And we talked about being light, really a big theme, a crucial theme, an important theme for every single Christian to hear. Would we go out and would we salt the earth? Would we go out and would we impact everyone and influence everyone that we come into contact with? Would we salt them? Would we be the light of the world? Would we go out and shine, obviously, for the Lord? These are big things themes, significant themes in scripture. And then we moved on and we talked about, and Jesus talked about murder in the heart. And he talked about, hey, if you look at your brother, if you look at someone and you murder them in your heart, you remember some of the words that Jesus said. He said, if you look at someone and you say raka or foolish one or empty one or worthless one in your heart, he says, you murdered them. And so that right there was a big theme, a significant topic. And then Pastor Samuel came the following week and he talked about adultery. He talked about sexual immorality. He talked about how Jesus said, hey, if you look at a woman with lust through your eyes, through your, through your eyes to gaze at her, And if you allow your mind, your heart to go to that place, even though it did not happen outwardly, it still took place in your heart. And so we talked about the significance significance of sexual morality and the significance of lust. And then we approached last Sunday morning. Last Sunday morning was a big one. Last Sunday morning was a significant one. We talked about divorce. And we really dived in and we really dug into this topic where Jesus said, hey, you are not to issue a certificate of divorce except for, and then we talked about a couple things. And if we're being honest here this morning, that was a big time significant subject matter. Well, what's ahead Next week, next Sunday morning, is another heavyweight topic. The subject, the topic of hatred and vengeance building up within the heart. And Jesus coming and saying, instead of vengeance, instead of hatred, would you love the person you hate? And would you do good to the person that you seek vengeance toward? These are topics, these are are subject matters that every single one of us in here, we struggle with them. These are subject matters that we need to hear about. But then we get to this passage this morning. And I don't know about you, but for me, when as I began to approach this topic this week, this particular passage, verses 33 through 37, at first, my first inclination was, It's insignificant. In comparison to divorce, in comparison to sexual morality, in comparison to murder, 
in comparison to vengeance and hatred, this theme, oath, vows, promises, commitments, to be honest with you, it seemed like a rather insignificant topic. And I was telling um, the folks here as we prayed earlier on this morning, for me, I took on this topic this week as, as I began to study it, thinking to myself, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to fill the time. And you know I can go for an hour. You know, you guys know I, I, I can fill a time slot with a Bible study. And as I came to this topic this morning, I was thinking, I, what am I going to teach on? It's so insignificant in comparison to the other topics and yet, as I began to dig in, as I began to let the Lord minister and speak to my heart on the text, the Lord began to show me that this subject matter was not insignificant. In fact, the Lord began to show me that more than sexual morality, more than divorce, more than maybe vengeance, what we're going to talk about this morning is actually something that a majority of us probably struggle with. It's probably something that a majority of us here this morning battle on a day-to-day -day basis, even more than the other topics. And so what is the point of this topic this morning? If you're taking notes, I want you to write something down. And this is sort of going to be the point that we're going to want to drive home this morning. The point that we're, that's going to be driven home this morning is this. A Christian is to maintain a high level of character through integrity and truthfulness. I'm going to repeat that. The point that we're going to drive home this morning is that a Christian is to maintain a high level of character through integrity and truthfulness. You see, the reality is that so many Christians do not see lies or dishonesty as a big deal. But I'll tell you this this morning, dishonesty destroys integrity, and it destroys our witness. When we choose to deal with people and talk to people and engage in conversation with people, especially those who are outside the church, if our integrity is destroyed, then our witness is destroyed. If we're constantly making up lies, telling stories, if we're constantly making promises, committing to do things, and yet we're the Christians that are constantly backing out or something else came up or I couldn't get to it, it has the potential to destroy our witness. It has the potential to destroy our integrity. Billy Graham saw integrity as something that was so important that he once said these words. He said, I'd rather lose my life than lose my integrity. He said, I'd rather lose my life than lose my integrity. You see, one small thing has the power to undermine everything that we work so hard to build. I want to stop right there for a moment before we get into our text, and I want to repeat that. One small thing one small lie, one not honoring some sort of vow or commitment that we made to someone has the potential to undermine, to destroy, to burn down, whatever phrase you want to use, it has the potential to undermine everything that we work so hard to build. Some of us have worked very hard to build a relationship and one lie can come and undermine the whole thing. Some of us have waited patiently and prayed patiently for someone we know to come to the Lord. And then because of some sort of dishonesty, because of some sort of character flaw, because of some lack of integrity in our life, it could literally undermine everything that we prayed for. All the years of evangelizing, all the years of witnessing, all the years of sharing your faith with someone, it could be undermined if our integrity is compromised. Now, it's with that backdrop that we begin Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 this morning. Would you go with me over there? 
Take a look at verse 33. Jesus addressing the topic of integrity, honesty, oath, vows, whatever word you want to use. Verse 33. These are Jesus' words. He says, again, I, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. What Jesus is quoting here is not an actual passage that you could find in the Old Testament. If you're with us last Sunday morning, when Jesus was addressing the topic or the issue of divorce, the actual thing that came out of Jesus' mouth was he was reciting an Old Testament passage on divorce. Yet here in verse 33, Jesus is quoting, but it's not an actual passage. What it is, instead, it was a summation of various Old Testament teachings on the subject of truth, on the subject of integrity, and the subject of honesty. If you're taking notes, would you write these verses down? These are some of the verses that Jesus was probably wanting to quote here when he took them and he summarized them into verse 33. Would you write this one down? Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, here out of the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Write this one down, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. It says, do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, it says, you must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use only his name. And so in the, in the Old Testament, the Lord allowed people to take oaths. And usually when someone would take an oath, they would use the name of the Lord as a part of the oath. And so it would be something similar to, hey, I promise or I vow or I take an oath to blah, blah, blah. And then they would go and they would say, and I, I, and I put this on God, or I put this in the name of Jehovah, or I take this oath in the name of the king, you know, or whatever, or the one who sits on the throne, or the one who's the king of heaven. I mean, people would come and they would make these vows, they would, they would take these oaths in his name. And so the Old Testament said, hey, okay, you're allowed to make an oath and you're allowed to attach the name of the Lord to it. But just like last week when we talked about the subject of divorce, you guys remember in the Old Testament, a certificate of divorce was allowed to be written under a certain situation, uncleanness, but you guys remember, Jesus would later on tell us that the only reason the certificate was written in the first place or allowed to be written was because of the hardness of man's heart, right? Jesus said, hey, don't just go and start issuing certificates because that's what was taking place. He says, the reason I allowed or re the reason I put this law in place was because man's heart was hard. And if there wasn't some sort of law in place, man would just go crazy and divorce for any reason. And so some sort of law had to be instituted because of man's heart. Now this week, we get into the subject of vows and oaths, and we once again find, find the Lord allowing people to take oath because of the hardness of man's heart. You see, it wasn't that God was like, man, this is a great thing. You know, this is how I'm going to get people to keep their word. I'm going to make this law, and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to allow them to make these promises, these vows that oftentimes they're not able to keep, and I'm going to attach my name to it. No, no, no. That wasn't the intention here. It was because of the hardness of man's heart. Listen, would you give me your eyes for a moment? And man's tendency to lie that the Lord allowed the taking of an oath. God's like, I know your heart. And even sometimes your intention is good. But you fail to follow through. And so the Lord allowed for these oaths to happen. Yet the reality is, <laughs> we're going to find out later on, God's like, I prefer you not. 
I prefer you not make these vows. I prefer you not make these commitments. I prefer you not take these oaths and then let people down. And so because of the teaching there in the Old Testament, and because there was the allowance for oaths to be taken place in the name of the Lord, the rabbis at that time, they took the old, these Old Testament teachings, and just like with divorce, they made a mess of the interpretation. Last week we saw, hey, God said, hey, you can issue a certificate of divorce for uncleanness. And you guys remember the liberal camp came out and says, oh, well, let's define uncleanness. And then the conservative camp came in and says, no, no, we're going to define uncleanness. And then the whole thing just became an absolute mess. And everyone was getting divorced for all sorts of reasons. And at the very end, they would just say, it's because of uncleanness. And the whole thing got out of control. And in the same way, when it came to oath, the rabbis at the time were, okay, well, what did, what did the law really mean? What does the law of Moses really say? And the whole thing just became this big, giant mess in its interpretation of what Moses was trying to say. The rabbis interpreted an oath as binding if included the right formula of words. And so the conclusion that the rabbis came and said, okay, if it sounds a certain way, or if you're going to take an oath, if it has certain words in it, the rabbis would say, okay, you can make a vow or a promise, but it has to sound like this, then it's legit. Then it's enforceable. But this is what would happen. Because the teaching or the interpretation became an oath or an vow had to sound a certain way, it actually allowed the person to honor their oath if they wanted to. And so when it came time to honor the oath and they were able, they were able to actually fulfill the oath or the vow, then they would say, see, just like I told you, just like I promised, you know, when I said Jehovah God King of kings, Lord of lords, and all supreme one. You know, I I said the magic words, the magic formula. I told you I would come through. Or if a person, because of the hardness of their heart, did not want to follow through on their oath or their vow, they actually had a loophole or an out clause to not honor their oath if they had changed their mind. So you come and you say, oh, well, you didn't keep your oath. You would say, well, I, I, or in my original oath, if you remember, I said Jehovah God, but, but I didn't say God Jehovah. I said Father God, but what I meant to say, and, and people would be able to come up with these outlandish, these ridiculous explanations for why they didn't, take, they didn't keep their vow. They didn't take their oath. And so Jesus begins to notice the sham the subject of oath had become among the Pharisees. Would you go with me over to Matthew chapter 23 very quickly? Matthew chapter 23. We'll be back in chapter 5 in just a moment. But go with me over to chapter 23. As Jesus takes notice that there are all these out clauses, all these loopholes to a person making an oath, taking a vow, and not honoring them. And Jesus also notices and hears that the Pharisees are teaching these ways in which a person can break their oath or break their vow. Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 16 with me. As Jesus prescribes in this chapter in Matthew 23, various woes on the Pharisees. In verse 16, Matthew 23, to the Pharisees, he says, Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple... It means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, it is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Verse 20, therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. 
And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. We can stop there. Listen, some of you are like, what was Jesus saying? This is what Jesus is saying. It's time to cut out the ridiculousness in our oaths. Oh, I swear by the temple. Why oh, swear by the throne? Well, I swear by the temple and the gold on the temple. And, and, and it just became an absolute farce. It became absolutely ridiculous the way that people would go and honor their vows through some magic formula of words and the way the people would come up with being able to break their vows or break their oath with the lack of certain words being said. And so Jesus comes down on this false teaching that seeks to accommodate a person to not have to honor their vows. What Jesus is doing here in Matthew 23 is he's taking their loophole away. Jesus is taking their out clause away from them. And Jesus is coming back, as we go back to Matthew chapter 5, he's coming to this place where basically saying, let's get rid of vows. Let's get rid of oaths. Let's get rid of you and I going and, and saying these things that in some cases we have no intention of fulfilling. Now, after hearing all this, you might be thinking, now, what was the point of making an oath if it was so easy to break? In fact, as we're talking about this subject matter this morning, an oath sounds like nothing more than a joke. Some of us might say, now that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here. Would you give me right for a moment, church? He says, some of us, our oath, our vows, our word, in some people's mind, they're becoming nothing more than a joke. I mean, how many of us have met someone who is very good at promising things? Who is very good at selling something? And yet when it came time to deliver, it was nothing more than a joke. You guys all, you guys have heard the phrase, fool me once, shame on someone. I don't know, it was either me or you. It was some, some shame on someone, fool me twice and shame on, I think it was me, I don't know. Somebody's shameful in that whole thing. But it, it's one of those things where we've been there before, right? Where we bought into it and then shame on me for believing you. And then you promise again and I'm so dumb that I believed you. And then you promise again and then just dumb me wants so badly to believe in you that you fooled me again. And then by the fourth, the fifth, the sixth time that you promise something, that you commit to do something or to be somewhere or to follow through on something, that person is nothing more than an absolute joke to you. You know, it's the picture. I don't know why it's always this is the stereotypical picture of what we're talking about this morning. It's the dad that promises to be at the Little League game, right? I mean, we always hear about that image and the dad not showing up. The kids at home plate ready to hit, looking in the crowd for his dad, and his dad promised that this time he would actually get off of work on time. And yet it's game six, and dad still hasn't made it to one game. It's that image of your joke. And your words are a joke, and your commitment's a joke, and your vow's a joke, and your oath is a joke. And so Jesus is coming in here, and he's wanting to make a point where he says, this is getting out of hand. This is absolutely ridiculous. Let's cut out the vows. Let's cut out the oath. And let's change. Let's change the things we say. And before we get into verse 34 this morning, let me also throw this out there. I believe that Jesus has the authority here in our text in Matthew 5 to come in and to say, okay, we're going to change it. Okay, the Old Testament, we were allowed to take oaths, but there's something different. There's something that's taking place here that's different now in Matthew chapter 5. This is what it is. It's the Spirit of God is now dwelling within a person. 
every single one of us who are believers, we have the Holy Spirit come and dwell in us. And the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit dwells in us, the Holy Spirit empowers us to live a life that's different. And so the old us may have all, may have been very much about the oaths and the vows and the commitments and the I'll be there's and you can count on me. But I'll tell you what, the new man in Christ, the new man filled by the Spirit of God, doesn't need to make an oath, doesn't need to take a vow. What Jesus is about to say here is he says, the man of God, the woman of God, their yes is enough or their no is enough. There's no need for vows. There's no need for oaths. Just say yes or just say no, and let's cut everything else out. Go with me over to verse 34. Look at what Jesus says. He says, but I say to you, do not swear at all. You're new in Christ. The Spirit of God has empowered you and empowering you to live a different life. And so how about we not swear at all? Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it, is God, for it is God's footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you shall not make one hair white or black. Verse 37, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Would you underline, if you have a pen, pencil, something that makes a line this morning in verse 37, would you underline the entire verse? It's such a powerful verse. Those of us who are following God, who are walking in relationship with him, that should be our commitment level to things. Yes or no. And there should be this recognition that anything else gives the enemy room to work. Now here Jesus says, let's not get caught up in notes or stringing together words that sound pretty or beautiful or well arranged. What Jesus is saying here, he says, the different oaths mentioned here are no different than the nonsense we utter today. By the temple, by Jerusalem, he says it's no different than what we hear today. Because what are some of the things we hear today? You can walk into every, any elementary campus and hear these words, I cross my heart, and what? Hope to die, right? You walk in elementary, it's like, I cross my heart and hope to die. I pinky swear, right? I mean, that's all this is. It's the same thing. It's stringing together words that sound wonderful and pretty to try and show you that I'm in. Or how about this one? I swear on a stack of Bibles. Bring the Bible. I'll put my hand on it, and I'll... And I'll why? The Lord knows your heart. Or how about this one? I'll put it on my mom. How many of you guys ever put something on your mom before? Especially in my mom's condition. And I'm, put, I'm not putting anything on her, okay? I mean, I don't know how long she got, so I'm not putting anything on my mom right now. But it's one of those, we go, I'll put it on my mom. Or your mom's already gone. I'll put it on my mama's grave. I mean... Sounds good. It sounds good, but so does, I put it on Jerusalem. I put it on the temple. I put it on heaven. I mean, whatever it is, it's like, why? Jesus comes to the conclusion of verse 37. He says, instead, let's just say yes or no. None of this pinky swear, cross my heart, hope to die. I put it on my, no, no, no. Yes or no. Everything else is an opportunity for Satan. Everything else is an opportunity for the enemy to get involved and cause discord. You see, the principle here is clear for Christians. Do not make vows to the Lord and do not make vows to others. Instead, learn the words yes and learn the word no. And there's a couple reasons why I think it's wise for us to institute this principle that I'm not going to make a vow, take an oath, or whatever it is to the Lord or to other people. If you're taking notes, would you run or maybe you want to write these down? First of all, number one, one of the reasons why we, don't, we shouldn't take an oath or take a vow is because sometimes we're unable to know for sure whether we'll keep the vow. You know, you're over here promising 
You guys have heard the phrase over-promising, under-delivering, right? We don't know if we can even keep the vow. We don't even know if we have the ability to follow through. And so how about we just don't make it? And whatever you're able to do, say yes. And if you're unsure, say no. But sometimes we don't know for sure if we're able to keep the vow. How about this one, number two? Second, we don't know what the future brings. We don't know what next week's going to look like. Only the Lord does. In fact, in James chapter 4, verse 14, we're told, hey, don't worry about tomorrow because, hey, it comes and goes. It's, it's but a vapor. James talked about it. He's like, tomorrow's tomorrow. But let's focus on today. You know, some of us are promising things, you know, five years from now, and it's like, who knows if you got five years? You know, I remember during Christmas, this past Christmas, I would have been able to say to my family, hey, man, I promise you in five years, we're going to Hawaii. Five years. Give daddy five years. We're going to Hawaii. Well, some of you know, Christmas passed, New Year's passed, and all of a sudden, on I think it was January 7th, I go to the doctor because I had some sort of problem with my arm because it kept falling asleep. And then next thing you know, I'm being told, hey, you know, you might have this um, bone marrow cancer thing. And so for three months, I went through all these testings. And I'll tell you, going through that and being tested for all these different sort of things, you know, at first the doctor said, it looks like you have something called multiple melanoma. And so it's um, blood cell. And so I'm like, you know, and the worst you go and you're Googling things and Google is probably the worst thing to do when you don't really have answers. And, and it's funny because during that time period, the Lord just taught me you could make a lot of plans. You know, you can promise a lot of things to your kids. You can say, hey, in five years we're going to and fill in the blank. Yet the reality is, who knows? Who knows what tomorrow looks like? Who knows what a year from now is going to look like? And so we need, to make, we, we need to make sure that we're careful not to be foolish and continue to commit to things and take oath to things that are in the future when only God knows our future. And so we're to commit to say yes to the things that we can say yes to. And we're to commit to say no to the things that we have the ability to say no to. And he says anything other than that, it's from the evil one. And what I want to do is I want to spend the remaining time we have together this morning to talk about something just really practical on this level. And just maybe even get a little bit personal for all of us on this topic of oaths and vows and commitments and yeses and nos and everything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Everything else is from the evil one. Or literally everything else gives the enemy or the evil one room to work in your heart. I've probably, over the years, especially in ministry, I've probably been hurt most by this particular topic over the years, probably more than any other topic. You know, so for me, when we talked about earlier, what about murder? What about adultery? I'm like, actually, this is for me personally a very, it's a very personal topic for me because, I mean, I'm the kind of type of person, I don't get my feelings hurt too often. In fact, I remember early on in our marriage, and I'm just going to be honest with you guys, Christina would always tell me things would hurt her feelings. You know, that hurt my feelings. That hurt my feelings. You didn't say I look pretty today. That hurt my feelings. And so she would always tell me things would hurt her feelings. And I would look at her kind of like, what are we, five? You know, things are hurting our feelings. I mean, we're adults here. Nothing hurts our feelings. And that's just the way that I am. Nothing hurts my feelings. And then I got involved in ministry. Then I got involved in pastoring. And then everything starts hurting my feelings. 
I went back to being five years old the moment I became a pastor because things hurt my feelings. Nobody came up after and told me it was a good study. Really hurt my feelings. Nobody came and, and, and you go and you have all these things. And one of the things that takes place in ministry is people promise a lot of things. People make some vows. People make commitments. And most of the time, it's with good intentions that people make commitments. And I've, noted, and I, and I've learned over the years that people sometimes let you down. Especially in ministry, people just tend to overcommit. And so at first, I would get really offended. At first, I would get really hurt. At first, I would just, you know, by the time Sunday night came, I'd want to just go to bed, put the head over my pillow, and just not come back next Sunday. You know, it's just like people commit to a lot of things. When we first planted the church, um, I, we were the only one with kids. Those of you that were there, some of you were single still, then she got married. Some of you were newly married. I mean, literally, Christine and I were the only people in the church that had kids. There was like my four, and that was the only, those were the only ones. And I remember about six months into our church, it was still the four of them. And then, you know, every once in a while, somebody bring a kid. But for the most part, they were the only four. And I remember this guy coming. He was walking in the neighborhood. We were meeting at an elementary school auditorium, and he could hear the worship through the doors in the neighborhood, and he was on a morning walk. He comes in. He's like, I didn't know there was a church here. And so anyway, so he's like, I love this, and he stayed for the service, and at the end of the service, he comes, and he says, I'm bringing my whole family back next week. I have four kids too, and he starts telling us the ages of his kids, and they're the same ages of my four kids. I'm like, oh my goodness, we about to have some church growth. You know, our children's ministry about to multiply times two, you know, four to eight in one week. That, this is pretty amazing. And so I went and I told Chloe. Chloe probably had it the hardest at the beginning because there really was nobody her age. And I went and told Chloe, I go, the guy, the guy, he's going to, he has kids your age. They're coming. I told you God was in this. And so little, I mean, I don't know how Chloe, Chloe was maybe nine years old at the time. Following Sunday comes, and Chloe stood at that door all morning, waiting for the man to bring back his kids that were her age. You know, for six months, I had to hear from Chloe, little nine-year-old Chloe, how, how I lied, and God wasn't in this, and we should have stayed where we were, and why did we plant this dumb church? And finally, kids her age were going to show up, and for 30 minutes, she waited at that door for that man to come back with, their, with his kids, and they never showed up. This is where you say, aw, aw. This is where you turn around and look at her and say, we're glad you're still here, <laughs> okay? But I'll tell you what. I, I can say with, with the surety that this man had good intentions. Uh, we're going to come back. I'm going to bring my family. I'm going to bring my kids. You know, he didn't think to himself, ha ha, pastor got four kids and I want to let them. No, no, no. He's not trying to hurt my kids. He had good intentions and yet he didn't follow through. And what happened? It gave the enemy room to work. Did it not? It gave the enemy room to work in this little nine-year-old's heart who was completely devastated that this family didn't show up to church. And I'll tell you, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Some of us, with our really well mean intentions, we overcommit. We underdeliver. We say we're going to be there, and we're not there. And your heart's right. I really wanted to, but I just couldn't. But let's call it what it is. You should have said yes, or you should have said no. And if you did say yes, you should have done everything in your power to honor your yes. But you also had the ability to say no. So let's call it what it is. It's a lie. 
It's dishonest. It opens up the door for people to challenge our integrity. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 said these words. It says, do not lie to each other. Do not be dishonest with one another. I guess you could say do not overcommit to each other if you're not going to follow through since you've taken off your old self with its practices. I mentioned in ministry as a pastor. You can close your Bibles. We're done this morning. I mentioned in ministry as a pastor, there have been people over the years with good intentions who after the third, fourth, fifth time, I just kind of said, I just can't count on them. No, 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 Pastor Randolph, this, this time. Okay. No, no, Pastor Randolph, you can trust me. Okay. And yet time after time, there's no follow through. You might say, but his heart's right. But at the end, it was a lie. Maybe something came up the first time. Maybe something came up even maybe the second time. But what about the eighth, ninth, twentieth time of saying, hey, Pastor Ram, I'm going to... It's a lie. It's just a lie. And I just, what my heart this morning for all of us is to just rest and learn and glean from Jesus when Jesus says, hey, say yes, say no, but stop with these promises because they're turning into lies. And you're giving the enemy room to cause discord. You're giving the enemy room for it to turn to bitterness. You're giving the enemy room for it to turn to hatred. You're giving the enemy room to blow your witness. Yes, no, that's it. 